from the dark web to your radio dial. You are listening to CyberTalk Radio on News 1200 WOAI. Welcome to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran. I'm joined this week by Dr. Greg White at the Center for Infrastructure Assurance and Security at UTSA. Thank you for joining us this week, Greg. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. So how do we end up with a Center for Infrastructure Assurance and Security at UTSA? Give us a, a little bit of, for the audience, uh, a background of how did you end up there and how did this, this program come about uh, so they can learn a little uh, about you? Well, I'm currently serving as a director, but I did not start off as a director for the uh, Center for Infrastructure Assurance and Security or the CIAS. Uh, it started back in 2001. Uh, that was when it was created in the fall of, or actually late summer of the of 2001. The reason it was created was uh, UTSA had decided to uh, jump into this cybersecurity game uh, to establish cybersecurity programs at UTSA, and they wanted to uh, obtain the DHS at then at that point uh, NSA designation of Center for of Center of Academic Excellence in Information Assurance Education. Uh, so uh, Dr. Glenn Dietrich, who was the uh, department chair for the Information Systems Department, which is where the security program started at UTSA, um, basically put the, put the center together, and then he hired me to be the tech director for the for the center. So, at the tech director for the center, you also uh, carry a, a load as a professor teaching courses. Uh, I was also hired to help build the the security program. I had had I had previously taught at the Air Force Academy for seven years, and had uh, helped them develop a security program at the Air Force Academy. Uh, and so when I was hired, it was to be the tech director for the, for the center, as well as to help them build security courses and to teach those security courses. Yeah. And for those of you uh, listening on 1200 WAI, you may have, uh, be driving around San Antonio. You may see some of uh, these billboards that say UTSA, the research university and um, top rated university. So uh, folks in town have seen and heard some about that. Uh, for those listening outside of San Antonio, if they're not specifically in the cybersecurity world, they may not have heard about UTSA yet. But um, can you share a little bit about now? So this program started back about 15 years ago. Um, where and how is, is UTSA ranked um, now over the, this 15 years of developing this program uh, in a nationwide from a cybersecurity perspective? Uh, well, we jumped in at the very beginning of the, the cybersecurity craze, if you will. There's uh, hundreds of universities now with that NSA DHS designation. Uh, we were one of the first. We were the first in the state of Texas. Uh, one of the interesting things about the program at UTSA is it's not housed in just one college. If you take a look at a lot of those other universities that have that designation, uh, they have a security program in the College of Business or they have a security program in the College of Science or College of Engineering in, in a college. Uh, UTSA has got security courses being taught over four different colleges. Uh, we've got security degrees and minors and, and uh, uh, concentrations in several different colleges. So we have a very broad multidisciplinary program. Uh, what that did, uh, as, as well as some of the research that we've got going on, as well as the outreach program, which is what the CIS is focused on, is the outreach. Uh, what that resulted in was uh, a 2014, the Ponymon Institute uh, did a, a study, uh, did a little survey, basically went out there and asked people, um, who would you rank as the number one cybersecurity program in the country? And UTSA came out as number one. Yeah. Um, we're, we're real excited about that number one ranking in 2014 because uh, they haven't redone the study, so we're still number one. There you and, go. Um, and then, you know, just to show that that wasn't a fluke, uh, just last year in 2016, uh, there was another study that was conducted uh, looking at solely the graduate programs around the country, and UTSA came out as the number two uh, graduate security program in the country, uh, right behind Carnegie Mellon. And for anybody who knows anything about computer science or computer security, I'm okay with being number two to Carnegie Mellon. That, you know, that yeah. means we're still ahead of MIT, uh, Purdue, uh, Berkeley, Stanford, a lot of you know very very well known universities. Yeah, and I think this uh, just speaks uh, volumes to the San Antonio mindset in general is that there's a lot of amazing work going on here. People are doing great things, and uh, we're this sleepy town in the middle of Texas that does not get the, the same level of uh, publicity nationwide as uh, some of the other cities in Texas, as the city in general, and some of the programs, I think, here is uh, the best-kept secret uh, outside of the specific industry area. So if you're in cybersecurity or you're looking for cybersecurity education, you've absolutely heard about UTSA. 
Uh, but for those folks, even in uh, just information systems in general, you may not have heard about or understand the, the level of the quality of the program that, that you guys have been able to build over there. And uh, I'd like to say thank you as an employer here at San Antonio for building those programs so that uh, we have uh, amazing opportunities and pools of graduates coming out every year uh, that I ideally can have some jobs for so we keep them in San Antonio. Well, thank you for hiring them because that's, uh, that's what students are interested in what's upon, upon graduation. And UTSA, I have to say also that UTSA is not the only a college or university here in San Antonio, obviously, with a security program. We've got five different centers of academic excellence now in San Antonio. So yeah. uh, we're in good company here. So you have this uh, cybersecurity information sharing, and you guys have received a, a research grant to do some work on developing standards there? Uh, yes. Uh, in, uh, d well, to, to, to go back just a little bit further, uh, folks may or may not have heard about the information sharing and analysis centers. Uh, there are uh, couple dozen of these things that were established starting back in 1999, 98 time period. Uh, they've been around for a long time, but they've been centered on uh, the critical infrastructures. So, you know, we have a financial services ISAC, you, you have a, a uh, oil and gas ISAC, you know, you have energy ISAC. Uh, the ISACs were designed to basically share cybersecurity information so that, uh, you know, the idea being if, uh, if Bank of America has someone banging away on their doors and has found a vulnerability in a the system, there's a good chance that Wells Fargo may have individuals doing the same thing. And it would behoove the, the sector, the community, to share, to go, come together and share information about cybersecurity incidents, cybersecurity vulnerabilities, uh, so that the sector as a whole would be better protected. You know, today, Bank of America notices it first. Next week, it's Wells Fargo that notices it first. So you, know, you, you can see where the cooperation is, is, is beneficial to everybody. Yes. Uh, the problem with the ISACs, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a problem, the, the, the issue with the ISACs was that they were designed for, as, as we mentioned, critical infrastructures. And if you take a look around uh, the city of San Antonio, for example, how many people are involved in the critical infrastructures? There's a lot of folks in a lot of other industries, a lot of other sectors, have nothing to do with a critical infrastructure. So there's no, there was no information sharing organization for these entities. And so the president in a, a, a year ago there basically decided to uh, issue a, in 2015 issued an executive order, um, executive order 13691 if you want to get exact, uh, that basically called for the establishment of an information sharing and analysis organization, standards organization. And uh, the purpose of that organization was to develop the guidelines, the standards, the templates, the other documents that would help um, organizations that wanted to form, wanted to become part of this information sharing ecosystem to form their own information sharing and analysis organization. Uh, Department of Homeland Security was tasked with uh, coming up with a grant, you know, and determining who was going to be that standards organization. And UTSA, in partnership with LMI and the Retail Services ISAC, um, won that grant. That's a uh, big news. So this is a, a grant that is active work is going on right now with it. active work is going on. Yes, absolutely. We have we issued our first documents, first four documents last uh, fall in September, uh, but we now have working groups that are and the working groups are, consist of individuals from around the country, inf individuals who know something about information sharing and want to be part of this movement. The uh, the guidelines and the standards that we're developing are very very open. Um, uh, collaborative environment, voluntary, you know. Uh, so we have individuals who volunteer to be part of our working groups and are working on our next set of documents. The first ones were almost introductory in many in, uh, uh, many respects, uh, introducing folks to different various aspects of having an information sharing organization. And now we're going to get down into more details and after that more detail and so on and so forth. But we're having ISAOs already forming and are registering with us. So if folks wanted to learn more about this or wanted to get involved with those working groups, where could they go to find that on the Internet? We have a website, www.isao.org, so isao.org, and that has information on our public meetings. It has information on the documents. You can download the first set of documents there. Uh, you can go there if you want to volunteer to be on one of the working groups. We'll have a discussion. You know, there'll be a discussion of who those working groups are, what is it that we're looking for and uh, how to go about volunteering. Yeah, and if you, you missed that website, you can also uh, go to cybertalkradio.com. Uh, we will post up the uh, replay and rebroadcast of this on Tuesday um, after here being live in the air. If you're listening to this on iTunes or one of the other podcasts or streaming media services, um, this may already be up on the Internet. You can go take a look at those uh, right now, or maybe if your podcast service allows you, you might be able to rewind and uh, 
listen to uh, Greg share that uh, website information back again. So with the the active uh, work going on on that, we had uh, Congressman Hurd from Texas District 23 on the the program, and he was talking about uh, information sharing between the federal government and private sector agencies. And he talked about uh, some of these information sharing in each of these industries, but there were, I guess, a good amount of information that may be at the federal level that's not getting shared down to private industry right now. Is uh, they're looking at introducing maybe some legislation to try to facilitate public-private information sharing. Is this something that the ISAO is involved on as well? We are actually not involved in that. As a matter of fact, the uh, Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, which came out uh, at the same time that uh, we were formed, um, is separate from us. Now, it, it, it's a law, and and we, of course, have to abide by the laws when we form our, you know, we have to keep, you know, be cognizant of those laws when we create our documents, our standards, and so on and so forth. But uh, those are actually separate efforts because the vast majority of the sharing is not going to be uh, uh, done between the federal government and industry, but between industry and industry. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there's a lot of people that may never want to share with the government. And the, and the ISAO, the structure, the ecosystem that we're creating allows for that. Do you want to share with the government? Great. Here's how you share with the government. Here's the kind of information that they, they would like from you. Here's what kind of information you can get from them. If you don't want to share, that's great too. I, I've used some examples uh, and when I go out and talk, go around and talk about the, the ISAOs. And, and one of the ones I use is uh, uh, the South Texas Mariachi Band ISAO. You know, it's a fictitious organization at this point. Yes. And people look at that and kind of smile. Uh, but, but I'm serious about that. Uh, because you know, you take a look at uh, mariachi bands or any small groups, you know, ma pa shops around town or anything like that. Uh, do they need to be worried about cybersecurity? Well, do they collect credit card information? Do they have websites? Do they use computers? Yes. Well, then, yeah, they need to be worried about security. Are these folks that are going to be sharing with the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security's uh, information sharing centers that they got the various different organizations. No, they're not going to be worried about that. They're not going to have the wherewithal. They're not going to have a 24 by 7 security operation set up. But will these people benefit from coming together maybe once a month for a luncheon, come together and share information on security, uh, compare uh, what what firewall are you using, what intrusion detection system are you using, what, what's this whole thing about the cloud and how does that work? Would they benefit from it? Absolutely. And that kind of sharing is important. So we want to be able to uh, help uh, organizations like you know South Texas Mariachi Band, ISAO form so that they can be part of this ecosystem. Now, there's on the other end of the spectrum. You know, we're going to have folks that are very um, well organized, much larger organizations. You know, things that will be closer to what the ISACs are, for, are, are uh, who may have thousands of members, and those folks may have the economic wherewithal to put together a 24/7 security operations center. They may be able to then share with the government. You know, so you, you get the idea that. And, it, and another one I like to use is the Cannabis Growers of Oregon. Yes. You know, here's a group of individuals. Could they benefit from coming together and sharing cybersecurity information? Sure. Are there potentially organizations out there that might want to gain access to their information for you know criminal purposes? Probably. Uh, so, yeah, they probably ought to be talking about cybersecurity. Are these folks are, are, are the type of individuals that naturally want to share with the federal government, however, Maybe not. Yeah, not today. Yeah, so you can see that, that sharing sharing absolutely is important. What Congressman Hurd is talking about absolutely is important uh, because there are those large retailers, retailers that, that could uh, uh, benefit from, you know, uh, intelligence reports talking uh, that they hear, you know, Sony kind of things, that, that, what happened to Sony. Absolutely they would benefit from that. But there's a large group of individuals out there that just are never going to be sharing with the federal government. So you're listening to Cyber Talk Radio on 1200 WAI. I'm here with Dr. Greg White from UTSA, and we're talking about an $11 million research grant uh, that the uh, university has to work on information sharing standards. Uh, we've uh, covered a few other topics. If you uh, missed the start of this broadcast, uh, we'll have a podcast and replay available on iTunes uh, and iHeart Media Streaming Services. Uh, as well as YouTube. So you can uh, look us up online at www.cybertalkradio.com uh, to learn more uh, about this episode or uh, any of our past programs as well. So with this information sharing, so you talked about public uh, and sector and private, and there's some separate uh, legislation and laws that have been passed on that. 
How does this uh, impact on the these industry information sharing with a sort of public utility like a, a CPS here in San Antonio? Do they get involved in an ener- energy information sharing center, or are they quasi government? How does that work in the view of these information sharing centers? Uh, well, CPS, you know, being part of the energy sector, that's one of the critical infrastructures. So there's already an energy ISAC that has been uh, that was created a number of years ago, and and like you said, some in some communities they may be pro- public, some communities they may be private. Um, as far as the ISAC is concerned, it doesn't matter. All these folks are uh, controlling the or delivering the energy for the various communities, and it is important that uh, they're part of the information sharing uh, ecosystem. And, and like I said, they've been around for quite a while. This information sharing going on, public to private sector. Now, if we're talking all of this at like industry and business level, and at the uh, security teams inside of these businesses, how does this get out into our communities? Uh, and it's one thing that um, I understand you're interested in a little bit is just community preparedness for cyber events as well. Uh, absolutely. Um, kind of two different questions there. The information sharing. Information sharing is obviously important. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have done in the information in the in the ISO, ISO we, we've identified four different. Uh, types of, uh, or categories, if you will, of ISACs. And one of the ones is a gr- geographically based one. The so ones that are currently there, if you take a look at the ISACs, for example, they were sector based, you know, like I mentioned, financial services or the energy sector or water or whatever. Uh, so there's a, a silo there. Um, one of the things that we've been pushing, and we've been working on this for years, and so it's a kind of a natural extension of some of the work that we'd already done, but uh, we've, one of the categories is a geographically based information sharing organizations. So, for example, the city of San Antonio or the state of Texas uh, can create an information sharing organization. And uh, any industry organization uh, that resides in that geographical boundary should be part of that information sharing. Um, There's multiple reasons for that. You know, we we think of a lot of the attacks as being sector-based, but if you go out there and just Google, uh, use Google, Google knows everything, right? if you go out there and take a look at uh, the number of attacks on communities and states, you'll see, find that there's a number, a growing number of communities that have come under a cyber attack. So this is important for the community. Uh, a few years ago, for example, there was a Hack Orlando Day. Anonymous, everybody knows about the group Anonymous, decided to have a Hack Orlando Day. Uh, they were upset with Orlando for some policies that they have about, you know, uh, there was a, a number of uh, different um, organizations that were trying to feed the homeless. And the city of Orlando was going around and finding these individuals. Uh, now that seems, you know, like a horrible thing. You know, these people are only trying to help the homeless folks. Uh, but what they were doing is that, you know, if you're going to be feeding a certain number of individuals, there are certain health rules that you have to abide by. So there was a very reasonable reason that Orlando, what, for what Orlando was doing. But you know, you you, you see what happened here. Anonymous yes. hears about uh, Orlando cracking down on people trying to feed the homeless, and so they decided that was an was uh, uh, bad enough that Orlando needed to be taught a lesson. So the city, well, you know, it was, it was a, a, a hack Orlando day on the city. Now, it um, didn't really have a lot of effect on them because it was back a few years. Yeah. Uh, but you can see what we're talking about. Who knows what kind of thing could happen in the city? Uh, Ferguson, when uh, the incident occurred in Ferguson, you know, that, that uh, got a lot of press. Uh, city of Ferguson, the police department, uh, you know, different entities within the city suddenly became targets of cyber attacks. So it behooves a community to have mechanisms and methods to come together and to discuss cybersecurity issues for who knows what reason someone's going to want to attack them in the, in the future. Yeah, now and it's uh, the, the mob of the Internet. I think everyone's heard uh, about fake news over the course of this last year as well, and this is one where uh, we've got to be careful out there on the Internet uh, with, reading a headline and then running with something like there you you had a whole community getting hacked and they were just trying to make sure that the the food that was going out to those folks uh, was actually clean and not uh, in a spot where you're going to cause more health problems than you would by them not having a meal today exactly yeah so with the the community plans it if they are there well established guidelines if uh, someone's listening and they want their community to get organized around uh, cybersecurity information sharing inside their city or their county or their state uh, where they could go to learn more about how to get this stuff set up or to learn if, if they already have one in their municipality that they just may not be aware of? 
In terms of information sharing, and that's just one aspect of what communities need to be considering when they're t uh, thinking about uh, cybersecurity programs for the community. But in terms of the information sharing, the best thing to do is to come to our website, once again, the www.isao.org. And there you can, uh, uh, there are links for um, who, to, who to contact. Uh, there you can register your interest in becoming an ISAO. We actually have uh, public forums, uh, online forums for people to learn more about it. So, you know, uh, frequently asked question documents. So a lot of information could be obtained by simply going to the ISAO.org uh, website in terms of information sharing. But uh, one of the things that we've been, we've been dealing with uh, state and local uh, cybersecurity programs for many, many years. We had uh, originally some money from the Department of Defense to go around to communities around the country uh, that had a, the, the wording was significant DOD presence, and we conducted cybersecurity exercises. The first cybersecurity exercise was conducted here in San Antonio. We did that uh, uh, back in 2002. Um, and, after, and subsequently, we've been to a number of different states, number of different communities, dozens of different communities, and have conducted cybersecurity exercises uh, more recently on, with DHS funding. Uh, but what we did as a result of that, we realized, you know, we go into a community, conduct a security exercise. Um, it would always be a success. It's, it, the first time you do a security exercise, it's always a success because people are going to learn something. If you've never done one, you're going to learn something from it. Yeah. And so we would do the exercise, everybody would be happy, slap each other in the back, shake hands, and we go on to the next community. Uh, then we go back to the community maybe a year later, however, and the type of individuals, by the way, that we, we sought to have come to these exercises, were, they were not the IT people. We said, leave your IT people home. We want mayors, we want city managers, we want chief of police, head of the EOC. We want the people who are gonna have, be handling emergencies. Yeah. Um, uh, we want people who are gonna be signing the checks. You know, those are the folks we wanted. And we were very successful at getting those, those types. You know, we've had governors attend our exercises in, for the state level ones. Um, but what would happen is you, you could go back to the, uh, the community a year later and the people that were there at the exercise um, still knew it was a problem, still knew that the community needed to do something about it, but what? There's, there are a lot of products, a lot of services out there. What do you start with? Where do we start? Um, oh, and by the way, we didn't budget for this, you know, three years ago when we put the budget together. Yeah. So how do we get started? So what we, we took a step back and we created this uh, maturity model, the community cybersecurity maturity model. And uh, what it does was basically provide an opportunity for you to uh, measure where you're at, so as a yardstick, if you will, to, to see where you are at your, in your security program. It then provides you, once you know where you're at, provides you an opportunity to see where you need to go. It's a roadmap. And, and it provides a common point of reference for, you know, City of Houston to be talking to the City of San Antonio, to be talking to the City of San Diego, everybody speaking the same language. Uh, and that is... Uh, actually led to uh, the development of the National Cybersecurity Preparedness Consortium, which uh, UTSA is the lead on that. It's a five-university consortium, and our goal is to help educate communities and states on cybersecurity issues and help them become better prepared. So if, if uh, I wanted to learn about this National Cybersecurity Consortium for the communities, where, where do I go online to find out more about that one? Uh, probably the best thing is just come to the UTSA's uh, CIAS um, you know, website and uh, learn and, and we've got links to things we talk about things and, and, and talk about some of the, the, the maturity model and have those kind of links on there okay and heading into our uh, bottom of the hour break here is there if I'm uh, a mayor of a, a city out there in America is there uh, someone that you has another city that's done a, a great job of walking uh, from the beginning of that maturity model on through it uh, that could be an example of uh, what I could go talk to my city council about rolling out in, in our city? Uh, the, the probably is the, and I'm, and I'm guess I'm sorry to say this at some level, but the state that's probably got the best program and the communities within that state is Delaware. Uh, they have had an individual who for years, the state CISO, who has been leading the charge and has been doing an excellent job at putting things, in organizing things within the state and within the communities there. Uh, the city of San Antonio has, has come together several different times and we've conducted exercises for them. Uh, we've helped them develop things like, uh, you know, every community has disaster plans. What do you have a cyber one? Do you have your, uh, an incident response plan for cyber incidents? You know, you need to have one. We helped San Antonio develop one. We helped Austin develop one. So there's some things like that you could come to see in San Antonio. Uh, but the, once again, the, the best state is Delaware at this point. So. 
And we'll be back after news, traffic, and weather to talk more about the culture of security. Welcome back to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20 year internet security veteran. I'm joined this week by Dr. Greg White from UTSA and the Center of Infrastructure Assurance and Security there. Uh, he's also involved in uh, some other programs that we're going to uh, talk about in uh, this half of the program. If you, you missed the first half, you can look us up on www.cybertalkradio.com. Uh, or check in and subscribe on YouTube, uh, iTunes podcast, or Pocket Cast to listen to uh, rebroadcasts of this episode and past episodes. So, uh, Greg, thank you again for joining us this week. Uh, on this one, I, to start off this segment, I'd like to uh, dive into something that uh, we have here around our office, and I see that you, you brought in today this new uh, fancy double deck of the Cyber Threat Defender card game. So, um, I think most folks have heard about Magic the Gathering or Pokemon or some of these card games. So can you go ahead and give us the story here on Cyber Threat Defender? Uh, sure. And if, if if you have ever played Magic the Gathering, then you can pick up the Cyber Threat Defender uh, card game. And it's extremely, uh, well, it's intuitively obvious if how to play the game if you've played Magic the Gathering or one of these other ones. Uh, yeah, the reason we started this a few years ago, well, actually, it wasn't even a few years ago. The idea was a couple years ago, but we finally got around to doing it last year. We had no funding to do it. We just, we just decided it's important. But what we wanted to do is to find some uh, mechanism for reaching out to primarily, uh, initially at least, uh, middle school, high school students to come up with something for them to do that would uh, help them learn basic concepts of security. The idea is that... Uh, it's part of a culture of security campaign, if you will, that we're, we're, we've been trying to launch at uh, UTSA. Uh, everybody knows about Smokey and, and what our responsibility is to prevent wildfires or forest fires. And we know about McGruff and that we can take a bite out of crime. And those programs, if you think about them, those aren't aimed at uh, adults. Those are aimed at student or, or elementary or middle school or high school students. We grow up with these. We need the same kind of thing in uh, cybersecurity. We need a I'm not sure what the character is, whether it's an armadillo or whatever, but we need somebody that we can dress up in a, an outfit and send down the Fourth uh, of July parade and, and have people understand that what their responsibility is to prevent fire for uh, cyber forest fires or to take a bite out of cyber crime. Uh, as a result of that, we were looking at what can we do. We've actually uh, produced a couple of electronic games designed for K through six uh, as part of the Cyber Patriot program. They've they've uh, deliver them to a number of different schools, the idea being to teach online safety or cybersecurity to kids at K through six. And we're looking for something else uh, for the middle school and the high school. And so we came up with this idea of card games. There's, there's been a number of games that have been produced out there, not a lot of card games. There's a couple other card games, and, and we just don't think that they've hit the mark. Um, they're, uh, if you were to play them, there's no excitement developed it during playing it. If I want someone to learn something, I've got to have them want to come back and play this game over and over and over again. So playability is exceedingly important in the card game. And that was what was lacking in a lot of them. So I told my folks, okay, what we want to do is develop this card game. We want it to be a collectible card game for a variety of reasons. Uh, and uh, we want it to be first and foremost, fun and playable. And secondly, they should learn something about cybersecurity. And we keep those things in mind. Uh, so if we're developing different cards, we look at them and say, okay, how, how uh, playable is this card? Is this card out uh, either uh, too powerful or too weak? Is nobody going to use it? You know, we, we look at the playability. We play test everything before we do it. So we've, uh, we've ended up with this Cyber Threat Defender collectible card game. And I, I think it's, you know, based on feedback that we're getting from uh, high schools and middle schools that we've delivered the cards to, uh, I think we hit the mark. Yeah. So this uh, Cyber Threat Defender card game, if I'm a middle school or high school principal or if I'm a teacher at one of the schools that I want to go advocate to my administration about how do we, we get these into uh, maybe our uh, classes, into the classrooms uh, to teach some of this maybe in science as we're talking about computers and the Internet 
or if I wanted to get this into our after school programs, where could I go learn more about the Cyber Threat Defender card game? Uh, you can come to the, the UTSA CIAS, the Center for Infrastructure Assurance and Security, our webpage at, at UTSA. You can just go to UTSA and do a search for CIAS. And we have a section on it's uh, the acronym CTD. So if you look for the pull down manual for CTD, Cyber Threat Defender, it has all the information you need to, uh, to learn about the game itself. Um, uh, as well as sponsorships. The idea is we don't want to be selling this to high school and middle school students. We want to get it to them for free. We want it in their hands for free. Uh, this means, however, someone has to pay for the, the creation of the cards, for the, the reproducing of the cards, and we're looking for sponsorships. We've had some, and, and we've had individuals, we've had individuals who said, um, that's great, I want to help, here's a check for $200. Uh, we've had corporations that have you know, provided $5,000 uh, what happens then at that point is that we will go, we'll ask the sponsors, there's some school or school system that you would like the cards to go to. If they have no preference, then we have a list of schools that have expressed an interest, and not just in San Antonio, but around the country. Uh, and we'll go to that list and we'll start sending boxes of cards to those individuals. It's not just boxes of the, of the starter deck, but we also have boosters. Uh, and each one of the boosters provides uh, some new cards. Uh, the, for those who've never played a collectible card game, what the boosters do is provide you an opportunity, you the player, an opportunity to customize your deck. And what it does is it gets the students, it gets the players uh, into the game a little bit more. So it's not like picking up a card of uh, a poker deck where every card's the same, every deck's the same. You know, you may have some strategy, but you know, um, I can expect the, the, the decks to be yeah. exactly the same. Uh, when I play someone with a Cyber Threat Defender, their deck may or may not look like my deck. They may have cards in there that that I did not include in mine, but I have to be able to respond to them. And so it's, it makes it really interesting. And, and, and because of that, you really get into the game more. You get into the cards more. You get into which card's a better card. What does this card do? What, is, what do I need to counter that card? Uh, and that's exactly what we want them to do because as they get into it more, as they read the cards, uh, each one of the cards presents some sort of either concept in security or a product or a service or whatever. And so what they're doing when they're reading that and thinking about it is they're thinking about security. Yeah. And so the uh, Cyber Patriot program is uh, initially, as you said, I, this uh, got rolled out to the, the kids that are involved in that. Can you share just a, a quick blurb about the Cyber Patriot program and uh, for those listening right now live? And uh, if you wanted to learn more about that, uh, we covered that in depth on a past episode. You can look it up in the Cyber Talk Radio archives. But for those listening right now, what's the Cyber Patriot program? Uh, the Cyber Patriot program, and interestingly enough, by the way, UTSA was one of the four founders of the Cyber Patriot uh, program, and we're still heavily involved in the Cyber Patriot, but it's a uh, program uh, primarily for middle school and high school students, uh, and that doesn't and it, and it includes not just the schools, but you could have there are, there are rules there are uh, there are mechanisms for individuals who are homeschooled to participate in in the program as well. But uh, it's a it's a competition. It's designed to teach middle school and high school students how to protect uh, computer systems. And uh, what we do is we bring folks together at the national championship. They, they, it's a free trip to uh, Washington, D.C., national capital region that you get if, you, if you're one of the lucky teams to be one of the national, in the national finals. Um, but they, uh, these individuals compete in how fast, how quickly they can, and how effectively they can protect computer systems, lock them down. Yeah, so this, this is the cybersecurity version of the uh, academic decathlon teams. Uh, basically, as yes, it is. Yeah. So it's a great program. If your school's not involved in Cyber Patriot or um, your, your kids are maybe have a team at the school and your, your kids are not involved yet, I uh, would encourage them all to all, all go out there and, and look into this. Uh, Cybersecurity is an area uh, where we uh, mention here frequently on the program the skills gap and the, the job gap that we have of uh, over 50,000 openings just in the state of Texas. And uh, even with the four programs um, in four different colleges at, at a university like UTSA, we're still not cranking out anywhere near the number of graduates that we need to fill all of those uh, cybersecurity related roles today. If folks wanted to get the card game for their schools to start helping us close that gap, what's the uh, URL for the, the website and things that they can go to to find that? Uh, the easiest way is to come to the UTSA CIS webpage, and uh, the address for that is www.utsa.edu 
slash CIAS. And then from there, we talks about all the different programs, including Cyber Threat Defender, which is, uh, uh, like I said, can be found under CTD. Yeah. So, if, if yeah, your kids are uh, like mine and they're playing Pokemon card games um, or Magic or these other ones, uh, I would encourage you. You can even go buy an individual deck. So these are not just uh, big orders where it has to. you have to buy a, a ton of them to go send them to a school. Um, you as an individual can go on there. You can buy uh, decks. You can get that and encourage your kids to start playing maybe in your neighborhood as well. Yes, yeah, so you can get single decks, uh, either the starter decks the, or the boosters. Uh, or you know one or two decks if that's what you want uh, by going to the UTSA bookstore, the online bookstore, and order it from them. Yeah, and this is a uh, for those new to card games. You do need two decks. Um, this is not like playing poker. So each player needs to have their own deck so that you can battle each other effectively. So I think this is a, a great program. I'm glad that you got it up and going, and then hopefully as we uh, get to spread the word about it here and uh, help evangelize that uh, we can get more kids across the country uh, interested in cybersecurity and aware uh, about cybersecurity because our young ones that are online uh, are some of the most vulnerable because the uh, bad actors that are out there, they don't care that this is an eight-year-old and they're taking advantage of them. That's exactly what they're doing. So they, there's a lot of um, scareware and things that is on the internet that uh, tries to uh, get our, our kids to do things that they shouldn't do. Like, I mean, they, they think that they were on a website they should be on and they see this thing pop up that says your computer's infected. It's not actually infected yet, but after you click on it, you will be. Um, and it's good to get this baseline level of education instilled, as you said. That we need to, it's not McGruff the crime dog, but whatever it is to get this base level education so that we can uh, reduce the human risk uh, in cybersecurity. Because I think is even we do all the technical controls and all this technical stuff right, if we, we haven't uh, helped people be successful in as part of that system we're going to continue to have failures yeah ab absolutely i agree with you wholeheartedly on that and that gets back to that culture of security we've got to get to the to the kids earlier and if you take a look at the cyber patriot program you know they've got uh, four thousand teams who've registered in the in the competition and they are periodically asked about you know how many of these folks are going to go into cybersecurity as a career field what are you doing to ensure that they go into cybersecurity as a career field and while that's great, if all you know, 4,000 teams, all the team members went into cybersecurity, we'd be better off. But you know, we're not worried about that because if those students participate, those students who are participating, if they go off into what, whatever field, I don't care what field they choose, they're going to be using computers. And these are individuals who are going into a new field using computers, but they know something about security. And that's what is important here. Yeah, because that baseline of just asking questions and being a little skeptical and then helping the, the folks around you to have a, a duty of care as you're thinking about using these as tools inside of your business still requires them to be used safely um, and they don't come with built-in uh, bulletproof guardrails on them. So uh, you're listening to Cyber Talk Radio on 1200 WAI. We're here uh, this week with Dr. Greg White from UTSA who is a uh, in the Department of Computer Science there? Is that where you officially sit in that college? Yes, that's where I'm at now. So I'm certain you have kids, whether they are uh, college freshmen that have just arrived on campus and they're not exactly sure what they want to major in yet, or um, as you're out involved in Cyber Patriot and other uh, community activities, you have uh, kids that are in high school or middle school coming up to you thinking about or in asking about majoring in a security program or in something to do with computers. Uh, how do you help those kids understand what the right program for them is? Uh, actually, that's, uh, uh, that's one of the beauties of uh, coming to UTSA because we have multiple programs out there. So whatever, wherever your, uh, your heart lies, uh, we've got a security program for you. But uh, when a student comes up to me or a parent, we oftentimes have parents coming up and talking to us as well, ask me, would, should I major in computer science or should I major in information systems or computer engineering or what should I be majoring in? Uh, normally, I, I ask them, well, it depends, and I, uh, it depends on you. What is it that you are interested in? For example, uh, are you interested in programming? Do you want to program the next best firewall or intrusion detection system? You love writing code. If that's what you love doing, then probably computer science is where you want to start. Uh, if, on the other hand, you 
uh, want to make that or create that next best firewall intrusion detection system, but do it in hardware because it's possible to do that. And then, then maybe, maybe it's computer engineering or electrical engineering that you want to go into. Uh, if, on the other hand, you want to take those products that other people have developed and be able to utilize them in a uh, organizational uh, environment in a, for the organization's network, and business's network, uh, then that's the information systems, the business side of things. So wherever your interests lie, whether it be more technical or less technical, software, hardware, it doesn't matter, we have a program for you out at, at UTSA. Yeah, and going through that, so you break it down into uh, kind of the three aspects of writing the software code, uh, doing the, the hardware. So like if I'm a, a kid that enjoys playing with, uh, my kids enjoy playing with the uh, programmable robot Legos. They like build things out of that. And then there's a little bit of software there, but that's more of like a robotics computer engineering in that aspect. Is that true there on that one? Uh, that, that's true. And, and th- that uh, description I, I just provided really is uh, is very broad there shall we say uh, if there's programming for example there's programming in the IS department there's programming in the computer engineering department so it's not that these folks don't program or whatever but if it's if that's what you want to be doing uh, at your job eight hours a day then that's computer science yeah you know, so it's it's a it's a rough estimation you know uh, first cut at what you might be interested in doing yeah. So one of the ways I've, I've tried to describe computer science to folks, I'd be, uh, I'm curious to get your perspective on this, is um, it's very much like a, a foreign language. You're a translator. You're talking to those uh, IS folks or you're talking to uh, business people that uh, have a problem that they want to have the computer solve. As the programmer, you're the translator in between uh, taking the language that that business person is speaking in and talking to the computer which listens to your language but it requires it to be very grammatically correct syntactically correct the computer only speaks perfect python is a language computer speak as an example uh, and i found in having that conversation with folks they're less intimidated about computer programming than they are at the abstract level it's because everyone takes a foreign language um, in school in texas so They've learned to speak Spanish or French or German or Latin or something there through school. They maybe have not learned, though, to speak Python or C++ or a computer programming language. But as soon as they have it as a concept of, oh, this is just another, quote, foreign language to go learn, now it's less intimidating for them. I would agree with that. And it's it's basically it's uh, you're trying to get that box, the computer, to do something. And you just have to speak to the box in the language that it understands. And uh, if you do that, I mean, all the computer is going to do is exactly what you tell it to do. It's not going to do something else. So you just need to learn how to speak to the computer. Yeah. You know, and that's interesting. Interestingly enough, that's something that, you know, people my age are more scared about doing, I think, than if you take a look at uh, kids, uh, the younger, the, this up and coming generation, if you will, you know, they're... Um, much less worried about pushing a button and having the machine do something that they didn't want it to do. Oh, go ahead and push the button. What the heck? So yeah, yeah. I just realized with the the tenth anniversary of the iPhone that our youngest has never he, he's uh, what they call you now these this post iPhone generation uh, where they've grown up not knowing that phones used to have keyboards on them or phones used to only have phone buttons on them. Now this whole concept of any a phone that's anything but a phone that's got a big screen doesn't register to them. They're like, why would you have ever built it that way? Oh, and they get introduced to these things at a very early age. I have uh, my first grandson was born just six months ago. And uh, my wife, when she's uh, watching him, you know, she's in the, in the car and, and my son-in-law and daughter are driving or something like that. And she's in the back seat um, and he gets just a little bit fussy. She pulls out that iPhone, she pulls up a a Baby Einstein video, and he's just happy and pleased as punch to watch the Baby Einstein on that little device. Yeah. Oh, it's it's pretty amazing. So uh, for for kids coming in, if I'm in high school or if I'm a parent of a a high school student, uh, what type of things should they be doing to prepare themselves for uh, computer science or information systems heading into college? Uh, if it really depends on the school system on the specific school that they're at because some offer 
uh, introductory programming courses. Uh, uh, we have a number of schools that don't do that anymore in the state of Texas because we're we have to worry about uh, you know, standardized testing and getting people past those things. And so some of the programs have been dropped. But if you're able to uh, take some uh, uh, courses in programming, and there's some high schools that actually have security, introduction to security courses, uh, then those would be great to have uh, in, in your background. But, you know, not required. If you've never had any programming and you come to college, that's okay. We can start you off. Uh, there we can introduce you to everything that you need but if you want to step up and take programming courses take some um, security courses if you have participate in these after school programs that you mentioned and there's a, a, an increasing number of them whether it be robotics whether it be security whether it be just programming contests so there's an opp- all sorts of opportunities yeah there's likely even if there's not formal curriculum at your high school these days there's a computing club or a programming club or a, a in san antonio area um, computing security, uh, even in a lot of these the schools now have cyber patriot teams, or even if your school doesn't have one, your district likely has one in the San Antonio area, and your kids could get involved uh, in those programs there to uh, get a leg up and uh, hit the ground running as they go into college uh, around this. So if I'm prepared, I'm ready to go do computer programming, I'm going into computer science, how do I uh, decide am I going to be able to do computer security and not just general programming? Because we, we hear about this all the time that um, programmers don't write secure code. The security stuff is hard. Is that really truth or fiction? Uh, I think it's fiction. My, me personally, I, my background, uh, I was not a security uh, geek, if you will, excuse the term there, uh, from the, the start. My master's work was in artificial intelligence and war gaming. You know, here I got a degree for playing games. You know, what, what more could you ask out of computer science? Uh, but af- I was in the Air Force at the time, and after I graduated, uh, instead of sending me to the war gaming center, the Air Force decided to send me to this new computer security office they were forming in San Antonio, Texas, and I fell in love with security. So I knew nothing at all about security, for heaven's sakes, just the opposite. Security was something that got in the way as far as I was concerned at that point. It stole valuable CPU cycles away from me, uh, and I fell in love with security. So I, I think there's security is not that difficult to understand. It really is not. Um, that's not to say that it's easy to create that next best firewall or intrusion detection. It's just like any program. You know, you have to have some, some uh, experience in, to be able to program or something. I have to have an understanding of things. Um, Secure software design is something that, that uh, actually, uh, if you ask me, all programmers going through a computer science program need to think about designing secure software because we have way too much software being designed and security is an afterthought. Uh, so uh, security across the curriculum, I actually wrote a paper on that in 1995 at the Air Force Academy. Uh, security should be taught across the curriculum. So everybody who's in a, in a uh, computer science program, programming uh, course will get at least a minimal amount of security. Yeah, and just as you said, the the information systems and computer engineering degrees have some programming in them. Um, There should be some security across all of those, some a little bit of programming. So you've got that common base level knowledge. But yeah, from my perspective as a a computer science uh, student uh, a long while back, uh, the security stuff is something that I found very interesting. We didn't have programs in it back then, but the uh, security stuff for me felt uh, much easier than compiler theory or some of the advanced algorithms and data structures classes. So if you're not intimidated by those uh, concepts in a computer science program, the security stuff should not intimidate you either. Well, the one thing about security is, and you don't see this a lot in other, other areas in programming or in computer science, is it's somewhat adversarial. You know, it's a competition at, at some level, and people enjoy it. You know, competition. It's me against. Uh, excuse the term, but the hackers out there, and I have to be securing my network against individuals who are trying to uh, break in. And am I able to do that successfully or not? You know, so it's kind of it's a, it's an exciting career field. This week on Cyber Talk Radio, we talked about the information sharing and analysis organization before the break. Uh, for those that joined us after the break, uh, Greg, can you give them a place where they can go look and learn a little bit more about that one? Uh, sure, the information sharing analysis organization. Uh, has its own website. We have a website, uh, and it's uh, www.isao.org. And that's uh, all about helping uh, companies uh, across the world and across industries and municipalities uh, share cyber information uh, so that we can better defend ourselves as a nation? Exactly. It's, it's, it's helping individuals, organizations uh, uh, come together and to develop uh, their own cybersecurity sharing organization, and then those 
organization can share with other organizations who can then share with the federal government, for example. So it's a, it's a large ecosystem. That's uh, great work. And uh, we are glad that uh, UTSA won the uh, grant there from Department of Homeland Security to spearhead that and get that up and going. And I uh, appreciate uh, your efforts on that, on the Cyber Threat Defender card game and on all of the other uh, wonderful programs you and your colleagues have uh, been able to develop over the years uh, out at UTSA. So I'd like to say uh, thanks again for uh, joining us this week and uh, for sharing uh, with our audience a little bit about uh, what we have going on here in San Antonio. Thank you.